God tonight for your presence that we felt in the service this morning. We thank you for how you challenged us in the message, Lord God, this morning. And Lord, we've come again once more tonight, God, to receive from you, to hear your voice. And Lord, we want to grow. We want to respond to your word in a way that pleases you tonight. So God, give us ears to hear, hearts to respond to you. Lord, bless our time of praise and worship. God, help us uh, to get our focus upon you. God, let us leave having received something of eternal value from your word tonight. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
worship you tonight, Jesus. We thank you that we can know you, God, that we can walk close to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You leading us and guiding us. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord, tonight. We worship you, Jesus.
worship him because he's worthy tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus, we lift you up. You're deserving of our highest praise, Lord God, tonight. We thank you for your sacrificial death for us on the cross. We thank you that through that you've given us life and life more abundantly. God, we have a reason to praise you. We have a reason to rejoice tonight. We have a reason to have a song in our heart and a smile on our face because of the life that you've given us. Hallelujah. We praise you tonight, Jesus. We worship you. We want your Holy Spirit to be at home in our hearts tonight. We want your Holy Spirit to be free to move and to operate in this service tonight. So we yield our hearts to you, God. We worship you. We praise you. We ask that you just have your way. Teach us from your word tonight. Draw us closer to you. Let us become a little bit more like Jesus tonight as we're in your presence. God, we'll just give you praise. We'll give you thanks. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The book of Jonah, I think it was two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, we, uh, we did our background and uh, some setting information about the book of Jonah. And tonight we're going to jump right into chapter one out of four. There's only four chapters in the book of Jonah. That doesn't mean that we'll be done quickly. <laughs> As you get into the book of Jonah, there's a lot of good things and we want to go verse by verse and uh, get some treasures from God's Word uh, that will be a blessing and a help to us in our walk with the Lord, I'm hoping, and, uh, and allow the Lord to just speak to us uh, through the book of Jonah. Uh, our Go Deeper studies, we, we did the book of Galatians about a year ago, and as we did in that Galatians study, uh, in this Jonah study, Go Deeper, Jonah verse by verse, uh, we want to attempt to counter the concept of applying Scripture to our lives and instead apply our lives to the Scriptures. And how many know this Bible is still relevant today, in 2018? We don't have to pick and choose passages to deal with issues that we're going through. We can read this book cover to cover and get what God's wanting to say to us, and it'll give us practical truths that deal with the issues, and we don't miss anything in between. But most of the modern church, what they're doing is talking about issues or topics and grabbing a few scriptures most of the time out of context and applying them to the issues. And, and that's uh, maybe one way of doing it. I'm not sure if that's a, a biblical approach. Uh, but we need to instead apply our lives to the scriptures. And we'll mature, we'll be more complete in our walk with the Lord if we understand all, the whole counsel of God, uh, that is contained in the scriptures. And so that's our desire in this study. And hopefully you'll see some things that will be a blessing that will deal with the issues and the circumstances and the situations in your life. And God's word can speak to that and help uh, in that situation. God's word is described, as we said before, in Ephesians 6, 17, as the sword of the spirit, right? It's not our sword. We like to sometimes beat people upside the head with scriptures. And that's not the intention of the Word of God, amen? We get the big family Bible out, one of the white one with a hard cover, and we want to go evangelizing, get some scripture pounded into people's heads. But it's the sword of the Spirit. And how many know the Holy Spirit is a gentleman? He's easily quenched, grieved, blasphemed, but he's a gentleman. He doesn't force us to follow Jesus, does he? He, he woos us, he draws us, and how sweet it is to be drawn by the Holy Spirit into a deeper walk with the Lord, and that's what we should want for others as well, is not to make the Word of God our sword, but to make it the sword of the Spirit, and say, Holy Spirit, give me the Word at just the right time, that when my friend or my loved one or my co-worker is facing something, you give me a scripture that speaks exactly to their heart and to what's going on, and we'll be amazed at what God will do if we'll allow the Word of God to be the sword of the Spirit. We'll attempt with God's help to bring out in context what the Holy Spirit is saying in a particular book using a verse-by-verse -verse expository study as we did with Galatians. Instead of just speaking about topics and issues, applying scriptures, as I said, most of the time that happens out of context. And it's better for us to be in the context of the entire book and then see the lessons and the things that God's trying to teach us and it will cover a whole lot more ground and make us a whole lot more mature. And so I'm hoping and praying 
that that will be what uh, the Lord does through our study of the book of Jonah. All right, we talked a little bit when we did the background and uh, life lessons and themes in the book of Jonah a couple weeks ago. We talked about Jonah is the call of God, right? It's obvious. That's an obvious theme. But there are some other themes as well. Uh, the word of the Lord, we're going to talk about that tonight. And Jonah's response to the word of the Lord. Where there's a famine for the word of the Lord in the day and age that we're living in. And uh, we need to learn some things about the call of God. The call of God is not just for uh, people who are going into what we would consider professional ministry. Or five-fold ministry. The call of God is upon every human being, isn't it? The Bible says what? Many are call, but few are chosen. So God's calling us, He's wooing us, He's drawing us to Himself, but not everybody is responding. As I said last, a couple of weeks ago, some of us have our phone, and we, we check out the caller ID before we answer it, and God's calling, but we're like, well, not right now, God, I'm, I'm doing this, right? I've, I've got this going on in my life. And God wants an open channel of communication. He wants us to be listening to His voice all the time. So we're going to jump into that tonight in chapter 1, and I think we'll see some things uh, that we can learn from. I want us to look at the map a little bit. You can see uh, the, the, uh, the cities uh, that are important in the book of Jonah. As you can see, uh, this is the area of Israel, and God told Jonah, who was a prophet, to go to Nineveh, which is here, and where did he go instead? The opposite direction, right? He went to Tarshish. And uh, so you can kind of get an idea of the distance. That was quite a distance for God to call him to Nineveh. And then when we understand that Nineveh was one of the most wicked cities in the Assyrian Empire, uh, they had committed atrocities against God's people. They had done sinful and uh, corrupt things. And, and they were known for that. They had, there was an infamy about Nineveh. And so not only was it a great distance that God was calling Jonah to go as a prophet, but Jonah didn't feel like they needed to hear the gospel. He didn't want them to have a chance to be forgiven and to, and to have their sins taken away because their sins were great in the eyes of Jonah and the people of Israel because they had even come against the people of God. And so you can see he went in the total opposite direction, running from the will of God. And we'll see that in chapter 1. Uh, but I wanted us to kind of see the map and, and keep that in mind as we look at uh, the book of Jonah. Let's read uh, chapter 1 in its entirety, and then we'll kind of jump into some of the things that God has shown us in the book of Jonah. All right, Jonah chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and cried, Every man unto his God, little g, see that? Cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God, and so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and a lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray you, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? And from where do you come? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Verse 11, Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto you, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried out unto the Lord, 
and said, We beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we're going to look at the first two uh, passages, first two paragraphs of this chapter, and uh, there's some things I believe the Lord wants to show us. The first paragraph that's really in this chapter is verses 1 through 3. And in verses 1 through 3, if we break those down and look at them and what the Lord's trying to teach us, we can see the word of the Lord to Jonah, right? The word of the Lord to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He was in full-time ministry, called to tell people the plan of God, the purposes of God, the word of God, just like a preacher today. And so Jonah only had something to say if God would first speak to him. He knew that. He knew he would have nothing to say unless God first spoke to him. And so the word of the Lord was a necessity for Jonah. For him to be effective in ministry, he had to hear from God. I dare say today, even though we have some preachers who stand behind pulpits who have not heard a word from the Lord, they're not doing anything for the Lord unless they have received a word from the Lord. We've got a lot of entertainers and life coaches and, and champion speakers, motivational speakers. But if someone's really going to be a preacher used of God today, they're going to have to get a word from the Lord. It's a necessity. And Jonah knew that. He understood that, that he had to have a word from the Lord. How much of the modern church still yearns for God to speak today? How many know when God speaks, things happen? Look at Genesis, right? The days of creation. God spoke and things came into existence. When God speaks, things happen. And so Jonah knew that. He knew that. And in some ways he knew it would be good things. But he didn't want the Ninevites to experience the good things of God. Because he had heard of their wickedness his whole life. But he also knew the necessity of the word of the Lord. If he was going to be a prophet for the Lord. And we need to be yearning for God to speak today, just like Jonah knew he needed God to speak to him. Has entertainment and motivational speaking by men replaced the necessity for the word of the Lord? God help us in 2018 to hear the word of the Lord like Jonah did. Amen? We need to realize it's a necessity. That's why we come to church. Amen? Not just to put a check on our good deeds checklist and say, God, oh, you owe me now. Look at all these checks. Right? That doesn't impress God. We come to church believing that the Lord wants to speak to us. Amen? And He may say something that we don't like, but that we need. Or He may speak blessing over our life. But whatever He wants to speak, we ought to realize it's a necessity if we're going to grow and mature into the people that God wants us to be. Listen to this quote. The manner in which God speaks. There were some four ways in which God spoke to individuals in the Old Testament times. They are, number one, he spoke in visions. We can see that in Amos chapter 7, verse 1. And he still speaks in visions at times, doesn't he? There's people in New Testament times who've also had visions. He spoke in dreams. Genesis 41, Daniel chapter 2. We know Joseph was an interpreter of dreams, that Daniel had dreams. Number three, he revealed himself by speaking directly to the prophets, mouth to mouth. Daniel chapter 12 tells us that. And number four, he spoke through his word. And everything that we hear from God, we ought to be weighing it against what? The Bible, right? If he uses a prophet, and he still does, use prophets and teachers and preachers and other men and women called of God, but we better make sure that what they say lines up with the word of God because that's the main way in which God speaks to us, isn't it? It's through his word. He's never going to contradict his word. The will of God will not contradict the word of God. And so we need to understand that. One can say without fear of contradiction that in New Testament times the Lord continues to speak in the same manner as He did in Old Testament times with one exception. And that is tongues and interpretation. God speaks to the New Testament church through all those other four methods but also through tongues and interpretation. But what's true about tongues and interpretation? 1 Corinthians 12, 
1 Corinthians 14. It better be for edification, exhortation, and comfort, and it better line up with the Word of God, or it's not to be received, right? And that's whether it's tongues and interpretation, or whether someone stands up in a service and speaks in the known language. For us, that would be English, and gives a prophecy. That prophecy is equal to tongues and interpretation, according to 1 Corinthians, and it ought to be weighed against the Word of God. If it's contrary to Scripture, what do we do? We dismiss it. We don't dwell on it. We don't beat up the person who gave the message. They just miss the Lord, like we do as well. Sometimes we don't get rid of the gifts because somebody missed the Lord. But just because somebody speaks or gives a message in tongue and interpretation or prophecy, we don't receive it unless it's scriptural, unless it lines up with the Word of God. And that's how we can guard ourselves against false teaching and false preaching false messages getting into our heart. But God speaks to us, so we ought to want it. When Bob and Sharon were here, I was so blessed and so happy because we've never had tongues and interpretation in a service uh, until just this last May when Bob and Sharon were here and God spoke to us about that He's going to send the wind of His Holy Spirit. And we ought to desire more of that. We've been praying for the gifts of the Spirit, but we, we should desire that not so that, we've, uh, so that we can say we've arrived at some plateau, but because we desire to hear from God. Amen? And he speaks to us through His Word. He speaks to us through preachers. But it's something different when supernaturally He uses the gifts to build up the body of Christ. And we ought to hunger and thirst for more of that as a New Testament church. Amen? God wants to speak to us. And Jonah knew the necessity of hearing God's voice. We ought to have that same urgency. God, we've got to hear from You in 2018. What was the word of the Lord to Jonah in verses 1 through 3? It was, arise and go, right? Arise and go. And you know what? God is speaking to the remnant church He's raising up in these last days. And you know what He's still saying, like He did to Jonah? He's saying to the church today, arise and go. Don't sit on your blessed assurance and think you're all fine. I'm going to heaven. I don't, I don't have to worry about anything else. No, He wants you to arise and go. And as you go, proclaim the good things that God's done for you. Tell other people about Jesus and be a witness for Him. And so the message is still the same. Arise and go. With the condition of the lost all around us and the nearness of Jesus' return, now is not a time to recline and relax and be lethargic as the body of Christ. God is saying the same thing that He said to Jonah. Arise and go. And go. There's people that need to know what the Lord can do in their life. We may not think they're worthy, just like Jonah didn't think the Ninevites were worthy, but God wants to reach them in His compassion and in His mercy, and He can take the most wicked people and turn them into something totally different, totally better, amen, because of His grace and what He can do in a person's life. And so we need to hear His voice today saying, Arise and go. Remember the great commission from Jesus? was a commission for all believers to do what? Arise and go, right? Go into all the world. Proclaim the gospel. Baptize them. Teach them what I've taught you, right? That was a great commission. And it's still in effect, right? And that's for every believer to be involved in. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God doesn't say we have to worry about how the seed is received. He just says, sow the seed. Arise and go. Be obedient. I'm with you. Not everybody's going to accept it, right? We've probably experienced that if we've been a Christian more than three hours, right? Not everybody's going to accept it, but we need to sow the seed and tell people about what the Lord can do in their life. Where was God telling Jonah to go in verses 1 through 3? What do we see? To Nineveh, right? We saw that on the map earlier. It's a pretty good distance. And uh, listen to this quote. God told Jonah to preach to Nineveh, the most important city in Assyria. The rising world power of Jonah's day. Within 50 years, Nineveh would become the capital of the vast Assyrian Empire. And so this is a 
prominent city. Of course, there's all kinds of reasons why God would send a preacher to this prominent place in the world's point of view because a lot of people can be touched with the message that he's preaching, right? And we ought to not shy away from big opportunities, big platforms that God gives us to be a part of in bringing the gospel. Amen? Sun Life Broadcasting and the platform they have to bring the gospel all over the world through television and through the different ministry opportunities, Bible fund and share it, all these different things. We ought to say, God, I'm in. I'm all in for that because a lot of people are going to have an opportunity to know Jesus and we can receive a reward. We can be a part of that effort. And even though we may not be that large as a church here in Colorado Springs, we can join with that effort. Amen. And we can see God do something. And that's why God was sending uh, Jonah to Nineveh plus their wickedness. Their wickedness, it says that God noticed it. He noticed it. It came up before him. And so sometimes we watch the news and we're like, God, do you see what's going on in our nation? Do you see what's going on in our city? Do you see this evil and this wickedness? And we can know from verses 1 through 3, it says that the wickedness comes up before God. He sees it. And he's not just going to ignore it forever. He's sending people to preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus and his finished work at the cross to bring a change. But if the people don't change, eventually judgment's going to come. And uh, people are going to be without excuse if they've heard the gospel. Amen. And that's why we need to tell them the truth. And that's why he, he was calling Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them the truth. Where is God calling us to go to it today? Think about this. A fisherman knows that you have to go where the fish are if you plan on doing what? Catching fish. Right? You have to go where the fish are. You don't fish in a lake where you know there's no fish if you're a real fisherman. If we're going to be fishers of men like Jesus said he would make us in these last days, then we're going to have to go where the lost are today. Amen? They're obviously not in the church building. We understand that, right? We're past the time in our country where we can just expect the lost to come running and weeping and crying into the church building and saying, what must I do to be saved? It's not going to happen, folks. We are the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And Jesus has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that we can go shine a light out there where the lost are, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, at our schools, right? We're going to have to fish where the fish are. And there's a lost people all around us that need Jesus. There's no shortage of sinners in Colorado Springs or America, is there? There's plenty of them. But we've got to stop expecting them to just come wandering into our church buildings saying, what must I do to be saved? And instead, we've got to say, Holy Spirit, I need you to empower me. I need you to baptize me to overflowing with your boldness, with your power, so we can bring Jesus right where the lost are at. Amen? And they can get saved. And then we'll bring them to church and they've already experienced Jesus, haven't they? And they'll be worshiping with us. That's what we're going to have to do in the day and age that we're living in. And that's what God was telling Jonah to do. Go to Nineveh. They're not going to come running to a covenant relationship with God like Israel had unless Jonah, unless a preacher goes to them and tells them. And it's the same about Colorado Springs and America. The church is going to have to arise and go. We're going to have to proclaim the message of the cross if we're going to see the wickedness change, if we're going to see the lost come to Jesus. Once Jonah got to Nineveh, what would his message to them be? We can see it in verses 1 through 3. God says, cry, cry against it for their wickedness. Cry against their wickedness in, in Nineveh. Listen to this quote from Matthew Henry. Jonah must cry against it. He must witness against their great wickedness and must warn them of the destruction that was coming upon them for it. Cry aloud, spare not. He must not whisper his message, but publish it in the streets of Nineveh, like the paper boy, right? Extra, extra, read all about it. This is the message of the Lord for Nineveh. How many of you would sign up for that? One of the most affluent, prosperous, largest cities in the Assyrian Empire, and God tells you to go cry out against their wickedness. But he's called us to do the same thing in Colorado Springs. Again, not very many people want to hear about what they're doing wrong. They don't want to hear about their sin and their wickedness and the evil that they're allowing to control their lives. But if we truly love someone, we'll warn them, won't we? Of impending judgment, of imminent judgment, if they don't turn away 
from that wickedness and that sin and that evil that's in their hearts. And God's called us to do the same thing. What might happen in the modern church in America if instead of trying to backdoor people into a relationship with God through summer carnivals, through Easter helicopter egg drops or movie theme messages, what, what would happen if we just cried out against the wickedness in our communities like God told Jonah to do? And we warn people that unless they repent, God's judgment is imminent. How about we just tell them the truth? Isn't John 8 still the, the, the truth, that the truth will make people free? And that's what we ought to be doing. Amen? We may not get the masses, but how about the few that really want a uh, change in their life? They don't want to be controlled and dominated by sin anymore. We need to be reaching out to them. Uh, to warn men of their sins and to tell them of judgment to come, whether near or far, is seldom met with approval. It is normally met with hostility and censure. Consequently, many prophets were killed in Jonah's day because the people didn't like the message delivered to them. As then, so now, men do not like to be reminded of their sins or warned of judgment to come. Consequently and sadly, most preachers are hirelings, saying what the people desire to hear instead of thus saith the Lord. But you know what? Those hirelings don't really love their congregation if they won't tell them the truth. Because one day, judgment is coming. And then where is their leader going to be then? He's going to be in judgment with them. That's where he's going to be. But true leaders will tell people, if you really love someone, you'll tell them what the Bible says. You'll tell them the truth. And we need to be those kind of people. God wanted Jonah to just simply go and tell the Ninevites the truth about their wickedness and their sin and that God could change it. What was Jonah's response to the word of the Lord? We can learn a lot about our response to when God speaks from looking at Jonah's response, can't we? He went the opposite direction and fled to Tarshish. We looked at the map. We can see it again. To go from Israel to Nineveh, it's quite a journey, but he went almost the same distance in a different direction, away from where God told him to go. How often do we do the same thing? You know, he fled from the presence of the Lord. What is our response when God speaks to us? When the word of the Lord comes to us today, it's easy to criticize Jonah, but are, are we only doing the part, the part of God's instructions that are convenient to us? That's what Jonah was doing, wasn't it? God, this isn't convenient. I don't, I don't like this. This isn't fun. <laughs> you ever had kids say that? Mom and Dad, this just isn't fun. They're doing chores at the house. God sometimes gives us things that just aren't fun, but they're necessary in our lives if we're going to be blessed, if we're going to mature in our walk with Him. Sometimes we criticize Jonah, but we don't want to do anything that's inconvenient in what we're willing to serve God in. Have we been 100% obedient to the Great Commission? Are we arising and going every day? Saying, God, use me, help me to seize those divine appointments that you bring my way to tell others about Jesus? Are we carrying out exactly and precisely the work of the Lord that He wants us to be carrying out in these last days? If we're not, then we better be careful about criticizing Jonah. Amen? Because we have as many or more excuses than Jonah did of why we don't do what the voice of the Lord tells us to do. We ought to say, Lord, help my response to your word. Be immediate. Be something that pleases you. Help me not to hesitate. Amen? Hesitate in what you're asking me to do. But God, help me to obey quickly what you're asking me to do. That's what Jonah should have prayed. Lord, I don't think they're worthy. I don't think the Ninevites deserve to hear this gospel. But God, if you'll help me, then I'll go. Wouldn't that have been a better response? But instead, he chose to run from the presence of the Lord. It's never good to run from the presence of the Lord. Amen? If you hear a word from the Lord that you don't like, I don't recommend running from the presence of the Lord. Learn from Jonah's response. He got swallowed by a great fish. And it really happened. It's not just a kid's story from kid's church. It really happened. And God used it as a gracious act to save Jonah from, from judgment. If he had kept going in the way he was going, he would have been lost as much as the Ninevites were lost. And if we won't listen to the voice of the Lord and do what God asks us to do precisely and exactly, carrying out the work of God in these last days, we're in danger of losing out with God as well. So we need to understand that. Number two, uh, we can see verses 4 through 10, the second paragraph of this chapter. God warns Jonah with a storm. Right? He warns Jonah with a storm. Storms have a way of getting our attention, don't they? Boy, we had some hail 
in Colorado Springs, and Brian and Glenda's house got beat up pretty bad, cars in their neighborhood. We went over and helped Brian load a U-Haul uh, about a week ago, and there were still cars in the neighborhood. I mean, it looked like a war zone where a baseball, softball-sized hail just beat the snot out of people's windshields and back windows and tops of their houses and everything. And uh, storms have a way of getting our attention, and, uh, and that's spiritually as well. When the storm clouds rise in our life, why does God allow that? He doesn't cause all the storms, but sometimes He allows those things to get our attention and to test our faith. Will we believe Him? Will we stand on the rock, Christ Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, or will we waver in our faith? And storms have a way of getting our attention. God allowed this storm in Jonah's life to get His attention because His response to the word of the Lord wasn't what it ought to have been. And so he used a storm to, uh, to get a hold of Jonah's heart and life. This wind was sent after Jonah to fetch him back again to God and to his duty. And it is a great mercy to be reclaimed and recalled home when we go astray, though it, may, though it be by a tempest. Amen? The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, remember the voice from Jesus? He said, why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the thorns, against the pricks? Why do you keep trying to go away other than what my plan is for your life? And how many times has God brought a storm in our life to steer us back where we needed to be? Maybe it was a sickness or a financial difficulty or something that was just bigger than us, a circumstance. And it was not pleasant at the time and God didn't intend for it to be pleasant, but He allowed it to force us back to a place of dependency upon Him. And that's what He did with Jonah here. He does that for us and that's His mercy. And His grace. Amen. The man or woman of God who is in the will of God is a tremendous blessing to the lost. Think about this. But that same individual outside of the will of God becomes a curse to the lost. Think of how many people Jonah had probably already ministered to about covenant love relationship with his God and what God could do in their life. And that he was a blessing to a lot of people that he prophesied to, that he preached to. But when he was running from the presence of the Lord and not responding to the word of the Lord like he ought to have been, he became, instead of a blessing, he became a curse. We can see the mariners are looking at his life going, what is your problem, dude? <laughs> right? What, what, well, you're the one causing all this problem. It's becoming obvious. And instead of Jonah's life being an example of his covenant God, his, his God who loved him, and being a positive an example for these mariners, they're looking at him in a negative light. And it's true for us today as well. If we're outside of the will of God, people are watching us either way. And if we're not leading them to Jesus and being a pure representation of Jesus, we can become a curse to the lost. And how, what a shame it would be for someone to end up in hell and they say, well, it was because of you, or it's because of you and your example. Because you said you were a Christian, but you did this and I followed your example. What a shame that would be. And so we better respond correctly to the word of the Lord and to the storms that God brings in our life. Jonah's disobedience to God endangered the lives of the ship's crew. We have a great responsibility to obey God's word because our sin and our disobedience can hurt others around us. Amen? Oh, well, nobody's getting hurt by this. We, we have this false concept. The devil's lied to us and told us that there's such thing as secret sins that don't affect anybody else but me. That's a lie. That's a lie. If you don't have the presence of God in your life, which if you're living in sin at all, the presence of God is not there to help you, you're not a blessing. You're a curse to those who are following your example. And that's what was happening with Jonah. He had run from the presence of the Lord, and the presence of the Lord is what those mariners needed to see to bring a change in their life. You saw them call out to all their gods and do their incantations and their chants or whatever they knew from heathenism. But Jonah had a chance to be a, a godly example to them. But he was running from the presence of the Lord. And we need to learn from what was going on with Jonah in that situation. What was the reaction to the storm that God sent? We can see in verses 4 through 10, the mariners were afraid. And these are men who do this for a living. They go, they're on the sea all the time, and they're afraid. They cried out to their gods, and all the while, what is Jonah doing? He's sleeping, right? He's fast asleep. And uh, 
you know, some of those people that can sleep through anything, you know, you could blow something up and they still stay asleep. That's what Jonah was doing. He's in the bottom of the boat. He's running from the presence of the Lord, but he has a false peace, doesn't he? He's asleep and everything's going to be fine. Even though he's running from the word of the Lord, even though he's running from the presence of the Lord, he's at peace enough to just be asleep in the midst of a storm on the sea that's got the whole crew worked up. There's something wrong with that. When we can become complacent and apathetic and different, lethargic in our faith, there's something wrong with us. If we're not stirred by a lost world and how the storms of life are affecting people in our community, there's something wrong with us. It's time for the church to not be asleep anymore, as we talked about uh, several weeks ago in our series, Awakening and Sleepwalking Church. It's time for us to wake up and point people to the answer. Amen? Point them to the solution to the storms of life, which is Jesus. The words fast asleep imply a very deep sleep. He was fatigued and worn out with mental anxiety. Now being as he thought secure and longing for solitude, he laid down to sleep, unconscious of danger. Little did he realize to what he would awaken to. Likewise, almost all of the modern world is fast asleep, at least spiritually speaking, unaware of the storm called the Great Tribulation that is about to burst over the entirety of the globe. And that's a time of judgment. We just studied the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights. We know it's a time of judgment once and for all for sin. And so we need to be telling a church that's asleep the answer to the storms that are coming. And it's Jesus. Amen. Who's going to show people the way to avoid the Great Tribulation? It's time for the church to lift up her voice and to proclaim the truth. Just like it was time for Jonah to wake up and they at least wanted him to do what? At least pray to your God. We all have different gods, but at least pray to your God. It's not right that we're all doing our thing and you're just down there sleeping. At least get up and pray, right? And see if your God might answer you because our gods aren't answering. And we need to be realizing the world is looking in so many wrong directions for answers and hope. And we have the hope, and His name is Jesus. Amen? We at least ought to be praying, we, but we also ought to arise and go and show this world that Jesus can make a difference. And that's what God was asking Jonah to do. And it's through the foolishness of preaching, just proclaiming Jesus, who He is and what He's done, that lives can be transformed. That's how you got saved. That's how uh, most of this church came to know Jesus was just through someone preaching. And so if we'll just say, God, I'll speak. I'll be a witness for you. It will be, would be surprised at what would take place. But too much of the church is asleep in 2018. Jonah's sleep wasn't just physical but spiritual, as is true with many people today. We need another great spiritual awakening in America. Amen? Getting back to the cross. Getting back to the basics of the Word of God. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. It says this, 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always, right? Ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Jonah wasn't ready to give an appropriate answer to the mariners, was he? He wasn't ready because he was running from the presence of the Lord. He was asleep when he should have been alert. He was going in the opposite direction of where the word of the Lord told him he ought to have been going. And if we're in that condition, how can we be a help? How can we be a blessing to others around us in 2018? The mariners were casting lots to find evil. That's about like rolling the dice today. It was something that even the soldiers were doing at the foot of Jesus' cross, if you remember. It's a, it's a form of gambling for, for most of the heathen world, casting lots. And so that's what they had resorted to trying to figure out where the evil was coming from. The world today has so many odd and peculiar ways of trying to identify what evil really is, don't they? How to get rid of it. They, a lot of times, they're starting to realize that some things are just evil, like we said this morning, like these shootings that keep happening. Why do people keep doing this? We're trying to get into the minds of these killers and these people. And it's evil, it's wickedness, it's sin. And they don't like that cut or dry answer because what, what does that imply? It implies some responsibility on our part, doesn't it? It implies that there is a holy God that we have to, uh, to answer to, that we're uh, going to be accountable to. 
But the but that's the way these mariners were. They didn't they understood there's something wrong here. There's a curse. This is not just a normal storm because these were fishermen. They're used to storms and they know how to handle them. They've done everything they know to do to, to, to do in a storm. Throw everything off board, lighten the boat, and they still couldn't get control in the midst of this storm. And there's people today, they they know there's evil influencing their life, but they don't know how to get rid of it. Jonah knew the answer, and so do we today if we know Jesus, but you know what? Jonah was asleep, and too much of the church is asleep. Instead of pointing people to the answer for the evil and the corruption and the wickedness in the world, we're asleep in our comfort zone and not allowing God to use us. Jonah is finally awakened out of his stupor and his sleep. He confesses that he is a Hebrew, and it is his God who is the creator of the sea and dry land who is angry with Jonah for his disobedience. How do you think the mariners felt about that? Oh, it's you, buddy. <laughs> and here you are sleeping. You know, he, he probably had some, some uh, dirty looks coming his way at least. And they were ready to, to deal with him. Listen to this quote from Matthew Henry. The storm is sent after Jonah because God has work for him to do and it is sent to fetch him back to it. He, Jonah, owns that he fled from the presence of the Lord and that he was here running away from his duty and the storm was sent to fetch him back. The mariners surely thought to themselves, if a prophet of the Lord be thus severely punished for one offense, what will become of us that have been guilty of so many and great heinous offenses? Think about that. They're going, wow, if God sends a big storm because his prophet just did one thing wrong, what's going to happen to the rest of us? Because we know our, our, our lives aren't right with God. And so it probably sobered them up really quickly. God's not called us to be fast asleep in these last days. He's called us to be witnesses. Amen. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power. That's what the world, that's what the church needs. And that's what the church needs to be bringing to the world is the power of God. Amen. But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. There's three ways that God calls us to be witnesses. And Jonah was called to be a witness, to be a proclaimer, to be a preacher of truth. God's called us to be witnesses today as well. Number one, we're called to be a verbal witness by God, aren't we? As believers. The apostles, I think John and uh, 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 James and John said many times in the book of Acts, we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard, right? We're not going out and telling people things that we haven't experienced ourselves, but how can we help but speak the good things that God's done? How many times has God healed us when we prayed for healing? How many times has God supernaturally provided for us, done good things for us since we got saved? But those are the things that God wants us to give a verbal witness of. He's not expecting you to expound Genesis to Revelation to someone, and you're not qualified to do that. But He's asking you to speak about what you've seen and what you've heard, what you've experienced in your own life. Be a verbal witness, and He'll help you. He'll give you the words to speak at just the right time if you'll make yourself available. Number two, be a lifestyle witness. You know what? Your words will have more of an impact if your lifestyle matches the words you preach. Practice what you preach. Before you open your mouth to be a verbal witness, live the lifestyle, right? If you're, not, if you're a hypocrite, nobody's going to care what you have to say. But if you're living a consistent, faithful example, and as we talked about this morning, your desire is to be found faithful, then when you begin to speak, your words are going to have impact upon people's lives because they've watched you. They've seen demonstrated in how you live every day what you really believe, right? If you know that you're trying to be a lifestyle witness. Number three, the third way God calls us to be witnesses, signs, miracles, wonders, and mighty deeds. And you know what? We've got a lot of people chasing this number three, chasing the signs and the miracles, the wonders and the mighty deeds. But you know what? These are always confirming. If you read the Bible, the New Testament, Mark chapter 16, these signs shall follow those who believe. When you preach the gospel first, when you've told people the message of the cross, who Jesus is, 
and what he has done, his finished work, then these signs shall follow those who believe. And if you believe, you will have preached the right message. We want to see the signs, wonders, and miracles without any preaching. We want to run in the opposite direction from the word of the Lord like Jonah did, but then still expect God to perform signs and wonders and miracles and mighty deeds. It doesn't work that way. When we open our mouth and say, God, I want to obey you with simple faith, simple obedience, then and we proclaim the word of the Lord that he's spoken to us, what we have seen and heard, what we know God can do in a person's life, God says he'll confirm that word with signs, wonders, miracles, and mighty deeds. We ought to be believing that for finished work worship center. Amen? We ought to be believing that he'll supernaturally demonstrate the power of God as we just are obedient to simply and faithfully proclaim the message of the cross. That's what he was asking of Jonah. And there was miraculous things that could happen in Nineveh if Jonah would just go and obey and preach the word. Just a simple obedience would have brought miraculous things. And we know later in the book it happened, right? Miracles happened. The whole place got saved. And so we ought to know today God will do the same for us if we'll just be obedient. So God wants us to be witnesses. He wants us to rise up and go. Yes, sometimes we get off track and God has to use a storm, a circumstance of life that's bigger than us to say, no, not that direction. Let's go this direction. And that's what he did for Jonah. But that's God's mercy. It's his love that he doesn't abandon us and let us go to the end of what we're um, chasing after and destroy ourselves. But he patiently and lovingly puts us back on track. Amen? Aren't you thankful? And says, no, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way of truth. And if we've gotten off track, we need to let God guide us. Amen? But we can learn, I think most of all, from these two passages, how uh, much of a necessity it is to have the word of the Lord today. Amen? Jonah knew that. He knew that. He learned that. And he'll learn it even more as we go through the book of Jonah. Our response to the word of the Lord every day. Not just once when we got saved when we were four or five, but every day, what's our response to the word of the Lord? Are we running from the presence of the Lord, or are we saying, God, I need the help of your Holy Spirit to live out what you're asking of me? If we'll respond in that way, God's going to bless us, and we're going to see supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles confirming his word. Amen? Let's stand tonight. We're going to close in prayer. I believe the Lord's spoken to us some things tonight that are very important. If you're listening to this message, I think most people in the room tonight have already given their hearts to Jesus. But if you're listening on our YouTube channel or our podcast and you've heard this message tonight, and the Lord's speaking to your heart and saying you need to get saved. Your life's not right with God. You know that if you were to die tonight, you're not ready to meet the Lord. The Bible says uh, in Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, Jesus says, I want to come in and eat with you and you with me. He wants to have a loving, living, loving covenant relationship with you. But the only way that can happen is for your sins to be taken care of. The only way your sins can be taken care of is believing in who Jesus is, the sinless Son of God, and believing that He came and died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins so that you could have forgiveness, so that you could have a life free from sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if that's where you're at tonight, the Lord's saying you need to get saved, you need to repent of your sins, you need to rededicate your heart to Jesus. As we close with these last two songs, I want you to make that your prayer tonight. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to live for you. I believe what you did on the cross was for me. And God, I don't want to be playing games. I want to know you and I want to walk with you. I want to respond to the word of the Lord like Jonah should have. I want to live my life to please you. And I believe the Lord's going to bring change in your life if you'll pray that prayer in faith. For us as believers, do you cherish, do you honor the word of the Lord as much as you should or as much as you used to when you first got saved? Think about that tonight. Is His Word still precious? Most of us, when we first got saved, we couldn't put the Bible down, could we? We were reading it. We were devouring it. We just wanted more and more of God showing us things in His Word. We need to be like that today. We need to ask God to help us with that. Has God sent some storms your way recently to try and get you back on track with His will of being a witness for Him? Maybe you've been running from the presence of the Lord or His direction for your life. 
God wants you to come back tonight? Do you need, to, need God to wake you up out of a time of spiritual slumber and help you to be alert and ready to be used of Him to reach the lost? We need to be ready always, 1 Peter 3.15, to give an answer of the hope that is in us. And if we're not there tonight, let's get there. Amen. Let's say, God, I've changed my heart. Let me be ready to be a witness for you, a verbal witness, a lifestyle witness, one who your Holy Spirit can flow through and do signs and wonders, miracles and mighty deeds. Amen. And let's make that our prayer as we close tonight with these last couple of songs. And let's respond to God.
you join hands with someone. Let's pray for each other before we dismiss tonight. And let's respond to the word of the Lord in the way that He wants us to. Amen. Not just at altar calls, but every day, what is the Lord speaking to us? What's the response He wants from us? So let's be clay, amen, in the potter's hand that He can shape and He can mold, that He can make it to the image of Jesus. Let's uh, lay our lives at His feet tonight in that way. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Jesus, for Your Word. We thank You for speaking to us through the book of Jonah. God, awakening our hearts to the necessity of the Word of the Lord. God, I pray that we would be hungry and thirsty for Your voice. God, it's Your voice that makes the difference. When You speak, God, You relieve our troubled minds. You give us wisdom and direction and insight. Lord, we need You to speak, God, to us in these last days. We need You to speak to finish work worship center. Give us wisdom. Give us your strategies, God. Give us direction on the ministry that we ought to be doing here in Colorado Springs. Lord, let the response that we have to your word be simple obedience. Hallelujah. God, that we would humbly obey you, Jesus, trusting your Holy Spirit to help us in that. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, help them to walk with you each and every day, to hear your voice, to respond to your word, in a way that pleases you, in a way that blesses you. God, may we never be running from the presence of the Lord. May we never shun the word of the Lord. But God, help us just to be obedient, to keep our lives laid at the foot of the cross, allowing you to shape us, allowing you to mold us, allowing you to do the work in our lives that needs to be done. Lord, help us to recognize those storms of life when they come. And God, that sometimes you allow those storms to get us back on track. Lord, I pray that when we have something that's bigger than us, a health crisis, a financial crisis, a family problem, whatever it is, God, that we'll look to you, that we'll depend upon you and know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And no matter what storm comes, God, we're going to trust you. We're going to believe you. Let us be in that place tonight, God. We just thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that you'll bless us as we leave this place. God, give us a heart for Colorado Springs this week. Let us be ready to give an answer, to be a witness for you in Colorado Springs, to point someone to the answer, to the only answer, to the one who can bring hope and forgiveness and peace of mind to their lives. Let us be ready to sow a seed of the gospel in someone's life. And God will be quick to give you the glory and the praise for all that's done. Give us a great week. Keep us close to you throughout the week. Help us to put into practice the things that you've spoken to us from your word today. We'll give you praise. We'll give you thanks for all that's done. In Jesus' name.